we're told it's good to go. You know, I always wonder, right now we're kind of driven by technology. Remember when all we had to do was look at the clock when to do things? Well, things have changed, and, uh, and while, it, while it's very helpful, uh, sometimes it can be frustrating too, but we live with that, right? And another thing it can do for us is help us with our patience. So that's all right, this morning, I'm going to be continuing in chapter 9, and I know that Romans seems to go on forever, and in a way, it does. There, there's just so much in Romans. <clears throat> now, today we're going to get into a few verses that bring us back to where we're thinking about this uh, election, foreknowledge, and predestination. Those are difficult issues, but I think that when we look at them in their totality and in context with all of scripture, we understand it better. At least, I hope so. If you don't, it's probably because I'm not getting across the way it should. But uh, just as a short review, uh, last week we discussed how Isaac could be called Abraham's only son because he was a son of God's promise to Sarah and Abraham. Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. Genesis 17, verse 17. We discussed Ishmael and the results of Sarah deciding to speed things up for his son, for Abraham, with Hagar. And it reminds us, it's just like us. <clears throat> You know, we just get impatient, and sometimes we think we can do it better than, than God. That doesn't mean we think we're God or say, I'll help you out, God. Well, we know God doesn't need any help, and what we need to learn from Sarah and Abraham is to be patient while God works with us, and that's a difficult thing to do. As we continue in chapter 9, a few more issues concerning Isaac and Ishmael will come out. And we'll, Paul will make this point in our study. We still see the result of Ishmael's birth even today. Turmoil in the Middle East and religious differences that have caused great upheaval. Paul continues letting the Jews know that birth or flesh did not necessarily determine what God had planned. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12 and look at verses 1 through 3. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now catch that, all peoples on earth, not just one group, but all peoples on earth will be blessed through Abraham. Let's take a look at... Uh, subject here of where who are the children of promise and not the children of flesh and we're going to look at some of God's sovereign choices let's look at verses 10 through 3 in chapter 9 not only that but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. <clears throat> that last verse there, 13, that seemed very strong, doesn't it? I think that when we look at when it was said, it makes a big difference. In verse 10, in one verse, Paul leaps 60 years into the future from speaking of Isaac as the only son of Abraham to 
Isaac and Rebekah with the birth of twin sons. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, Genesis 25, 20, and 60 when the twins Jacob and Esau were born, Genesis 25, 26. And once again, a distinction between the twin boys was made by God. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 again. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told. The older will serve the younger. <clears throat> Some things to consider with this passage of Scripture. This passage details another restriction upon the identification of who are or are not children of Abraham. All of the posterity of Esau being cut off, despite the fact that they were not merely children of Abraham, but of Isaac as well. And their being cut off did not derive from some visible reason for it, such as rebellion or refusal to honor their father Isaac. The proposition Paul was establishing by presenting these facts is that it was not by natural descent alone that the Jews themselves were reckoned to be children of Abraham because the group identified as Jews were far from being his only natural descendants. Now, remember, you go back to those verses from Genesis and it says all people of the earth. It didn't select anyone. And here again, I think uh, Paul is trying to bring the Jews to where they need to be, and that's to look at Christ. I mean, when you look through all Romans, you see he's doing that, but he's also going at them with things they understand. And the trouble is, the things they understand, that's the way they want it to be. Are they any different from us? Don't we want things to be the way they, that we want them to be? Of course. But Paul's trying to show them the difference in what God has done to bring them to where they are at. There was a separation in the immediate family of Abraham when Ishmael was cut off. And there was another separation in Isaac's immediate family when the Edomites, children of Esau, were cut off. But a dramatic new factor was involved in the separation of Esau and his descendants from the recognized posterity of Abraham. Consider, the Jews could have justified the exclusion of the Ishmaelites and the preference for Isaac upon the premise that Isaac was the only legitimate son, the only son of his true wife, the only son of a free woman. Remember, Ishmael's mother was a slave. So we can see they can rationalize that, right? All right, well, he really, he really wasn't born of Sarah. You know, you know, so we can overlook that. But when you get into Isaac and Rebekah and their children, it's, it's a completely different story. Completely legitimate children. In the end, in the exclusion of part of Isaac's posterity, no such distinctions were visible. Esau being not merely a son of Isaac's lawful wife, but his firstborn at that. This shows that the choice of Jacob was altogether a sovereign act of God, not dependent on anything that either Jacob or Esau had either done or left undone. The election coming before either of them was born. Now, when we, I want you to keep in mind this word election and what's really taking place here. Is it really the in, individuals that, that God is looking at or is it something more? Before discussing the doctrine of election, as it is called, which surfaces in these verses, it is important to note exactly what the Lord with reference to the election of Jacob in preference to Esau. Now, if we go back to Genesis 25, 
and verse 23. Twenty-five, twenty-three says, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So, and that's, that's an entirely another story that we'll kind of look at a little bit. I, I hope you realize when we're looking at what Paul says in Romans, how important it is to go back to look at the people he's talking about. And we also see in these people the very thing that is with us today. Human nature takes over and makes us do things that maybe aren't exactly what God wanted. But God still uses us. That's, that's the difference. There is no problem whatever regarding what God did. The problem lies in the reasons people suppose God had for doing it. God's sovereign act of choice between Rebecca's twins took place before their birth, Genesis 25, 23. But God's decision was not because of sudden and unaccountable changes of mood or behavior. He didn't say, wait a minute, you know, I want to choose this one over that one. God's sovereign choice, he knew. He knew what had to be done. Now, another thing, when I look at the Old Testament, God worked a little different in the Old Testament than he does in the New Testament. And I don't understand all the whys and why fours and all that, but I know that, that when I see the New Testament refers back to some of these issues, I do get an understanding because I see what happened there and I see what the result is with us today with Christ. God foreknew everything concerning the unborn twins, but he chose to tell Rebecca a part of what was foreknown. Consider, first, two different kinds of people were about to be launched into the stream of history one weak, the other stronger. Second, and what is meant by two manner of people? King James says that, and I think that's a, a better way of looking at it, two manner of, of people. Because when you think about that, you realize that, all right, two manner of people. One's gonna act like this, have these characteristics, and the other's gonna act like this and have these characteristics. At least that's what I, I get from, from that in scripture. Esau's life quickly followed the pattern God had foreseen. He was a profane person and a fornicator. If we go over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, we find this said, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Thus Esau was rejected and Jacob chosen because of God's foreknowledge of what would take place in the lives of both of them. When Isaac blessed his sons, <coughs> The scriptures relate that he did so by faith concerning things to come. And back again in Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. And it is arbitrary and contrary to reason for anyone to suppose that God made choice between those brothers without taking into account the things to come, right? He sees around the curves. We just see down the straightaways. He sees around the curves. 
You would also think this blessing a natural occurrence by reading Hebrews 11.20. But it was far from that. No, I shot. You read this and just think if we didn't have the ability to go back and look at these people and what took place during these times, we would only have this. We wouldn't have an idea of what was going on. This blessing was anything but, but natural. Now, all right, I'll ask you a question here. Now, Rebecca was told, right, that two boys would be born, and the older would serve the younger. Now, before we look at these verses, my question is, do you think that Rebecca related to Isaac what she was told by God? You know, why am I asking that? Well, we'll, we'll take a look at, look at that. Uh, do you think Isaac sought out God's counsel about his sons and who would be blessed? Let's go over to Genesis 27, verse 27. Do a little reading in there this morning because I think it's important we, we get a feel for, for what took place. All right, in uh, 27, verse 27, we find this. So he, so she went to him, and well, I'm, in 20, I'm in the wrong one. Yeah, I'm, so she went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, now I'm going to back up before we read that blessing. Let's look at the first verse in 27 and go from there. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give it you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands with, with the smooth part of his neck with goat skins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please set up and eat some of the game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. 
Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from honey. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please set up and eat some of the game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him and Indeed, he will be blessed. Well, like, what, what can you say? Talk about intrigue and things that happen. And look at the human nature. You see why I asked that question? Did Rebecca really relate to Isaac what she had been told from God? I don't know. Be in, this would kind of indicate no, because wouldn't you have thought that Isaac would have known what was to take place? But look at the result. Look at the result. Here again, human nature is involved. So when you, you read a story like that, doesn't it just kind of go over the New Testament and they're just mentioned. But when you've got the full story, look how it comes alive. Look what took place to, to make this happen. Of course, God was in control of the situation, but People are people, aren't they? And God uses whatever they did, no matter what, to make it, make it happen. But look at how Isaac felt when he realized he had blessed the wrong son. And that caused the hatred between Esau and Jacob. So, the other question is, do you think that, that Isaac sought out God's counsel about his sons and who would be blessed we don't know but it makes you wonder why wasn't this something that he knew it didn't stop God's plan but it does make you, you think nothing in the election of Jacob and the exclusion of his brother had any bearing at all upon the eternal destiny of either now each individual having still been left free to choose the direction of his or her life. You know, we, we kind of forget that and think, God is completely driving the bus, and he is. But the thing about it, he still leaves us these choices. But it was concerned primarily, if not indeed totally, with the building of the nation of the covenant people. Consider, it should be remembered that Paul's entire argument here is to the effect that other factors besides fleshly descent had always been involved in determining the seed of Abraham. God's election was a factor in it, but the factor entered 
into the determination as a consequence of other factors. Esau was rejected because of what God knew he would become and of what Esau's character would produce in the lives of his posterity. You know, remember uh, something here, that Esau was willing to sell his birthright for a bowl of stew. And, you know, Jacob, he was right behind that. He says, you promised this is what you would do. Here's your stew. Sometimes we sell out for things like that in this life, too. So there, there's another story right there. And nothing about the roles were, were reversed. Would we not be reading that Esau was chosen by God instead of Jacob? Now, verse 13. This is an interesting verse. <clears throat> Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. When do you think this was said? Right about the time that the birth took place? You know, sometimes that's the way we think. We, we'll read that, and, and that happened right then. But that's not when that was said. The last prophet in the Old Testament said these words. So let's go over to Malachi chapter 1. And let's look at verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Now this subtitle, uh, Israel Doubts God's Love. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declared the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Now, put this in context. He's actually talking about groups of people here. Because this is Israel doubting God, God's love. This was not written of Isaac's sons before they were born. But centuries afterward, this being a quotation not from Genesis, but from Malachi. Now, I'll share a note on, on those verses here. The phrase Esau I have hated does not refer to Esau's eternal destiny. It simply means that God chose Jacob, not his brother Esau, to be the one through whom the nation of Israel and the Messiah would come. God allowed Esau to father a nation, but this nation, Edom, later became one of Israel's chief enemies. Jacob and Esau, as individuals, were not the principal concern of the election, but the nations which they would produce. Despite that, the election had to begin with the individual where it started. The selection of Jacob was a selection of a people rather than an individual. You know, uh, when we, we look at all this, uh, we go back and uh, when we look through the Old Testament, you know, the church, I think for a long time, you know, we kind of pushed the Old Testament aside. But with Without the Old Testament, the New Testament cannot possibly come alive to us. It cannot. And I think here we see that. We'll read a phrase in the New Testament, just like Paul mentions these names. But what does he expect? He expects us that we know the story behind it. And it makes all the difference. 
Something to think about. This harmonizes with Genesis 25, 23, where the manner of people, and that's from the King James Version, looms as God's great consideration. If Esau had been made the patriarch instead of Jacob, Israel would never have continued long enough to deliver the Messiah to mankind. But the overruling providence of the all-wise God interposed to prevent such a thing from taking place. God's choice did determine which would be the patriarch of Israel. The idea is here rejected that God ever chose any man to eternal life or death before he was born. It doesn't enter the picture there. It has to do with the choice of nations. I hope, I hope that makes sense because these individuals still had the free choice, just like we do today. We like to think we have made the right choice, right? That's why we're, we're, we're here, and that is a good thing. There's a lot to think about when you get to reading Romans. But like I say, it makes you look back at the people, the things they did, but yet, no matter what they did, God was still in control of the situation. But see, they still had the free choice to do the things they did. Rebecca chose to do what she did with Jacob. Although, here again, I just can't help but think, why what didn't she relate to Isaac? We don't know whether she did, but looking at it, he was surprised. So, all right. Any comments on that? There's a lot here, Ed really, when you think about it. Lots to think about. All right, and when we get into the next verses, 14 through 23, we're looking at who are the objects of God's mercy. And let's, let's read those verses. <clears throat> what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. The scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? A lot said there. Here again, when you look at these, these verses and we see what's talked about, all right? Without the Old Testament, how would we know anything about Moses? We just say, hey, there it is, I take it by faith. But we have all this information about Moses. We understand what's taking place with this verse when we know that story. What about Pharaoh? What if it just Pharaoh was mentioned here? We'd say, well, it was a king of Egypt way back when. But no, we know the backstory. The Old Testament gives us that story. There's going to be some unique things, I think, come out of this lesson than what we've probably had an understanding of before. Now, in verse 14, upon the uniformly wicked populations of earth, God has decided to show mercy to those who have accepted through obedient faith the mercy which is freely offered to all. 
But the salvation of those thus receiving God's grace does no injustice to the wicked who never obey the truth and are therefore lost. Paul explains why in verse 15. This quotation is from Exodus 33, 19, and it affirms the sovereign right of Almighty God to save whomever he will. No basis of any kind is there stated as an explanation of God's saving some and rejecting others. But any understanding whatever of God's dealings with his human children demands the assumption that there is a just and rational foundation for everything that God does. Let's look at verse 16 and we'll, we'll quit there. Paul's words were still being directed at the Jews primarily. No person merits salvation. In the last analysis, it is the gracious outflowing of God's loving grace and mercy that makes salvation possible for any person. This is the conclusion that Paul drew from the quotation from Exodus 33, 19. All right, now, next week we're going to take a look at, at Pharaoh, and we find in there that God hardened his heart. Well, did he really harden his heart, or did Pharaoh have about ten opportunities not to have his heart hardened? Something to think about. All right, well, We'll quit there. Are, are there any comments that anyone has? Oh, good. Covers it just perfectly again. <laughs> All right. Before we, we quit, let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, once again, we thank you for this time that we have to come together and study for your, from your word and, and help us to, to piece it all together the way that you want us to do. And, and we have an understanding of, of the people in the Bible, and, and they're just like us. They have the same problems that we have yet today. And help us to realize that you're there working with us on those problems, just like you have been from the creation. And we're so grateful for that, dear God. And we ask that you continue to, to bless each one that's here this morning and, and those that are listening. We realize that our knowledge of you comes from your word and our relationship with you comes from our prayers. We get a better understanding of you and a better relationship from prayers and from studying from your word. But don't only help us to be students, but help us to be doers of the word, as James says. Help us to always desire to help where we can, to do those things that would alleviate someone's suffering. Help us to be kind. Help us to be loving. Help us to just understand we are people, and you do love us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Good morning. Do you love Jesus? I caught you off guard. Some of you were like, I wouldn't prepare for another question. I just said good morning. Uh, do you love Jesus? Yeah, well, you know what? You're in the right place. You're in the right place. This morning we'll have spent time... Uh, certainly, we've sung about Jesus. You know, we'll pray through Jesus to God the Father. Uh, we'll spend some time in communion together reflecting on uh, God's great love, the gift of his son. And uh, you might hear Jesus preach this morning as we talk about him here in just a little bit. I want to extend a welcome to you. If you're visiting with us, consider yourself a guest. Uh, a special welcome extended to you. And I hope that you'll be convinced before you leave and as you leave later on that you were in the right place this morning. Um, and if you're watching online still, we're thankful that you're here, and the same holds true for anybody who might be engaged with us for the first time, uh, virtually speaking. Thankful for your presence. Look forward to the time of worship together. Uh, the, the idea of our love of Jesus and a relationship with him uh, helps us to encounter turbulent times. We continue to rejoice because the empty tomb that we celebrated last week is still empty. You know, and, and so Jesus lives today. And uh, we allow that relationship with Jesus to give us comfort during difficult times. And uh, we, most of us are aware of the news of, of Charlotte's passing, Charlotte Jordan, who passed away a few days ago. Uh, but it's the comfort that we have in God's word and what Jesus did uh, that allows us to experience, again, a measure of peace uh, through a trial of life such as that. Uh, we're thankful to have the time to worship together. I'm glad that you're here as I look around uh, again every single week. Seems like I see a new face or two. Uh, th folks are just now being back out. Glad for, uh, for you to return and uh, thankful to be together. Uh, let's see who we got here. I think Bob's leading the singing this morning. Uh, Bob's going to come forward now as we continue to worship God in song together. <laughs> Good morning. Let's begin with number 782. 782 mm -hmm. 
Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer. Worthy of glory, honor, and power. Worthy of all our soul's adoration. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Worthy of riches, blessings, and honor. Worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Lift up your voice in praise and devotion. Saints of all earth be for him should bow. Angels in heaven worship him saying, Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Worthy of riches, blessings, and honor. Worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Spirit, wisdom, and power, may we describe Thee, glory and honor. Worthy art Thou, worthy art Thou, worthy of riches, blessings, and honor, worthy of wisdom, glory and power, worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving, worthy art thou, worthy art thou. <clears throat> uh, the next song will be on the screen, uh, not in your book, Faithful Love. And I'll never 
be the same. For I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. Next we'll sing number 290, I love thy kingdom, Lord. Oh. Uh-huh. 
Father, we're so very thankful that we can be here this morning to give you praise and honor and glory as our Heavenly Father. Father, we're thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace. We're sinful people at times, and Father, we know that you love us and that you will forgive us. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of your kingdom, to know that we're your children. Father, we're saddened today to know because of one of ours have passed on. And we pray that you'll be with the family and help lift them up. But we do have the fact that eternal life is in, in view. Again, we, we pray that you'll give us the weather all to help the people that are hurting, people that are fighting sickness, give us the opportunity, Father, to minister to them and to, to help them in any way that we can. Father, we love you. We want to do what is right. And we pray that you'll walk beside us each and every day. But again, as we said, we do make mistakes. And Father, as we make mistakes, we pray that you will forgive us and that we will have strength to carry on. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Now before communion, we'll sing number 726. Seven two six. And let's uh, let's just sing verses one, two, and four. One, two, and four of seven twenty six. saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet we heard thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, the Son of God. But we believe thy footsteps trod, its streets and plains, the Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high 
Amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, Forgive they know not what they do. But we believe that it was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. But we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We walk not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth of sin, who graced to have their wandering view, then low to earth all prostrate been. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies, but we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies. Each week we surround this table in remembrance of our Lord and Savior. To help prepare our minds, I'd like to read from John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Would you bow for me, please? Dear my Father, we come before you again giving you thanks. Thankful so much for the love that you have for us. Thankful for your son. Thankful for your plan. We're thankful for his sacrifice. Father, as we uh, take this bread, the bread that represents Christ's body, help us to uh, reflect upon his, his life that he lived and the example that he lived here on earth. And help, help us to reflect upon our lives in, in comparison to his. Again, we thank you so much for the love that you have for us. We ask if you, again, bless this bread that in each of each, every one of us that partakes all this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. about me again. Then we, Father, we come before you again asking your blessing upon this cup, this cup that represents the blood that was shed by your Son. Father, we thank you again for the love and your grace. Again, Father, we're thankful for the plan and the promise that uh, we have to, to look forward to being with you in heaven someday. Uh, Father, we know that uh, we don't know when that time will come. Our prayer is that uh, you be with us to continue to to be good examples and, and be a light in this world to tell others of the good news uh, and that you uh, come to take us all home uh, fairly soon. Again, we thank you so much for all, all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
The song for the reading and, and lesson will be number 711, 711. Psalms 63, verses 1 through 4. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as, I, as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Probably should mention, just because uh, curiosity may strike some of you, that Laura and Elijah went down to Arkansas to visit someone down there. And uh, hopefully, I would imagine they're going to worship down there before making the journey back. So I appreciate prayers for their safe travels. I haven't checked to see if they're going to encounter rain, but we've seen enough of it. They, uh, they might get wet on the way back. I mentioned that we would uh, talk about 
Jesus. We, we spent quite a bit of time here in recent weeks with a specific focus on uh, the life of Jesus, reflecting on some of uh, his miracles, uh, parables that he taught. Uh, we did a series of lessons about statements that Jesus made in the, in the book of John where he talked about his identity to speak about uh, who he was. Um, certainly last week to reflect on uh, the empty tomb. Uh, today we're going to begin a series on the, the Sermon on the Mount and, and Matt begins in Matthew chapter 5. Now, you know, we're going to study about some of the things that Jesus taught. Now, when you think about the Sermon on the Mount as it's recorded there in the Gospel of Matthew, covering a number of chapters, it may be more familiar than, uh, it may be the most familiar uh, of, of Jesus's, especially when you think about it in the context of a sermon or an extended uh, discourse that Jesus delivers here, fairly well known. So I guess the challenge when kind of opening up and beginning to study that together is, you know, are there anything new to be gained? You know, I, I probably as we read through this, uh, very few of you perhaps uh, haven't read through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You know, whether Bible classes or lessons or even your own personal study. Uh, but I hope that there'll be new things re revealed. You know, I, I find that, uh, and I hopefully you're the same way, that, uh, you know, decades can go by. And I can still, in, in the reading and study of God's Word, uh, new things will, will be revealed. Uh, new truths will jump off the page. Perhaps I'll think about something in a different way because of the circumstances in which I find myself, whatever state of life that I might be in. I hope that can be true to you as well as we kind of begin this uh, course of study in Matthew chapter 5. Now, as we begin, kind of just a little bit of a background that, again, may be familiar to a lot of you. But when you look at Matthew chapter 5 and the way that it's laid out, there is a very similar section or passage that's found in Luke chapter 6. That, uh, and I'm going to, we're going to basically look at Matthew chapter 5, but if you look at Luke chapter 6, it, it, it's, it's very similar. Sometimes it's referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. And it said that because in Luke chapter 6 and verse 17, uh, there's a reference made to Jesus being on a level place. Now in Matthew chapter 5, it begins by saying that Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And Jesus begins teaching. Now there's some, and again, I, don't th I think you could make a good case either way. And I don't think it's ultimately uh, critical in our study. But there are some who look at what's described in Luke chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 5 and following you to say, well, this is the same instance. You know, and, and, and the reason why many might point to that is if you look at Luke chapter 6, the things that are Luke records are all found in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there's some words a little bit different. It, it's much shorter. And so some would say, well, it's just a condensed version of what Matthew recorded. Some might think those as, as two different recordings, two different instances, because again of the, the, the location, whether it be a mountain or, or a level place. But I've read some who, who said, hey, to, if you really want to make sense of that, there were, there were certain mountains and, and even ones that I've been identified that have a, a level place on a mountainside where this could have taken place. So, you know, in your own personal study, you might have a, a strong opinion one way or another to think, you know, are these two things that are recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke the same event or different? Again, that, uh, that could be left up to uh, interpretation. I think there's value. And so we might from time to time, including this morning, make reference to something that Luke records because of, uh, of a slight difference. Uh, it also may be possible... And in fact, I can tell you that this, this happens, you know, that, that Jesus, we think about the recorded words of Jesus. Do you think that Jesus would have taught things more than once to different groups of people? Yeah. I, I've been asked to, to speak at a church uh, this summer. I'll go down midweek to speak in a, in a summer series. And, uh, you know, I don't want you to miss out on that lesson. So you'll be hearing that same lesson at some point. I guarantee it. All right. You know, uh, and so preachers are known sometimes. They might have a, a favorite sermon, one that people really engage with and respond well. Or, or again, uh, will we'll take certain lessons and, and maybe tweak them and, and change them and to deliver uh, a similar lesson in a different location. So that could have been the case as well uh, as you go back, from, back and forth from Matthew to Luke. So, again, some background information as you reflect on that. 
uh, again from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and then you look over maybe on your own later on in, in Luke chapter 6 and see what's recorded there. As Jesus begins, as once more seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down. Kind of a, a, an unusual thing in, as we think about it. We kind of do things backwards, right? The speaker stands up. You know, I, I read somewhere that, that sometimes there were times where the speaker would sit down. That was a position of authority and the, the audience, the crowd would stand up. What do you think we should do that this morning, right? I'll, I'll sit down and have you all stand up. And some of you are thinking, well, you better preach a lot shorter than Rick. If we're going to try that, you know. But, you know, things were a little different. Jesus would sat down and, and, and even uh, some of the things that, you know, speculation about where Jesus would have been, this environment would have provided a kind of a, a, a good setting for he to be heard, for people to um, be able to reflect on the things that Jesus was about to share. The Sermon on the Mount, as it's recorded in Matthew chapter 5, begins with what's commonly known as the Beatitudes. You know, a uh, series, and, and throughout the, the, uh, this section, there's so many wonderful things, so many lessons that we'll, we'll, we'll uh, learn and, or, or simply be reminded of as we kind of go through this course of study. But as Jesus begins with these Beatitudes, and he starts in verse 2, and he says he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, and he begins with these statements that seem a little odd. They, they, they don't seem like they, they make sense to us in a, in a natural way when he starts with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He then says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, and some of these just seem a little bit strange, you know, because we, we, we recognize, and if you do study on the, the idea of blessed and you think about the, the Greek word and some of the more modern translations, we will simply just substitute the word happy there. We kind of, we kind of get that, but, but that, doesn't, that doesn't add up altogether, you know, and, and we live in a world today that, uh, you know, many people believe in. And even the country, we're, we're you know, encouraged to, to enjoy the pursuit of happiness, right? We have that right as people, and we all seek it. We all strive to be happy. Chances are, and I don't know, maybe it's happening a little bit more. I, I certainly miss, you know, uh, you know, Sunday, you know, going to lunch as a family after worship. I don't know, some of you maybe have started to do that, or, or maybe you just hit the drive through or many of you have just gotten, gotten used to going home. So whether that's happening now or not, but if you reflect back on, you know, that time when you used to leave and, and go to, to worship and then came that critical decision, you know, where are you going to go eat? And nobody in the family would agree, right? That's just my family, right? Nobody else has that experience. Now, I know a number of you have that, don't have that problem because you go to the same place every single week. And I know who you are, right? I already know if I want to go visit with so-and-so, I go to Wendy's. If I want to go visit so-and-so, I go to Captain D's, right? I've missed that though the last year, and I got to get back into that. I'm hoping that uh, things will, you know, kind of sol calm down just a little bit. You know, um, but sometimes we don't agree, and, and you know what? We, we go to the places though that, that make us happy, right? If you don't like, um, you know, if seafood is not your thing, you're not going to Captain D's. And if you don't like, uh, you know, you don't like Mexican, you're not going to go to the Mexican restaurant. You might have certain things that you enjoy that bring you a certain amount of pleasure or happiness, and you, and you seek those things out. That's kind of natural. So to, to read it right from the very beginning, just simply focusing this morning on the very first beatitude that, that Jesus shares here, blessed are the poor in spirit. Or if you were to take that liberty and, and put in the word happy there and say, you know, happy are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You want to, let's struggle with that for a second. You know, we might have to, to dig in just a little bit more to think, well, what exactly is, is Jesus referring to when he says, 
The poor in spirit. Because, boy, uh, the word poor is not something that I, I usually strive for in any avenue, right? I, I don't want to be poor in anything. And I think maybe, maybe there's an understanding that, that's gained from most when we look at that and we think about what, is, what does Jesus mean when he reflects on, on being poor in spirit. I think it's, it's somewhat clear to us. We think about our, our, our inner condition. We think about the idea of being, uh, being humble and having humility. You know, and, and to be poor in spirit means that we're going to have to empty ourselves we're going to have to rid ourselves of pride, of, of arrogance, of, of those things that, that we think that, that we matter, so to speak. I think about uh, what uh, Jesus said in John chapter 15, and, and that's in the discourse or the discussion where Jesus talks about the vine and the branches. And he says this very simply in John 15 verse 5. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so that's the kind of attitude that we need to have, that when we approach God... That we come to him poor in spirit, realizing that, you know what, it's not about me, but it's all about God. Probably the easiest way to illustrate, illustrate that truth is to allow Jesus to kind of illustrate it for us. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a story, a parable that, that he, uh, he used specifically because there were some who really struggled with this kind of idea. There, there was a hardship for them to, to not get past, you know, how important they felt that they were. It even says that. Luke 18 and verse 9, it says the parable that Jesus told was to some who trusted in themselves. They, that they were righteous. And not only that, they didn't, that, that opinion of themselves then transferred into how they treated others. Their treatment, the way that they viewed others was with contempt. And on this particular occasion, this parable that Jesus tells involves two men who go into the temple to pray. And there's one that's a Pharisee and one that's a tax collector. And the Pharisee stands by himself, praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. You know, whether that be extortioners or unjust adulterers or even like this fellow, this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the problem didn't exist with those two individuals or specifically the one who had such an opinion of himself and, 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 and was self-righteous. And I would suggest that the opinion, or, you know, this gentleman's problem didn't, you know, just didn't happen right at that moment. It wasn't that he, he showed up there, saw the tax collector, and it caused himself to, to feel better about himself. This attitude existed before he went in. Went in for that occasion. To go in specifically to pray. He felt highly about himself. There was nothing that God could, could do for him. He had it all together. He stated as such. He had to remind God of the things that he was able to accomplish, the things that he did. Wanting to receive a justification. But in addition to that, to, to look at this gentleman from a distance and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not like this man. Thanking God for, for such a thing. Well, how pitiful, Right. You know, Jesus spoke that parable because there were, there were individuals like that that existed. There were people who, again, thought so highly of themselves and, and looked down at those nearby. Well, this is the perfect example of one who chose not to empty themselves. That, that person wasn't poor in spirit. Humility was a, was a lesson that needed to be learned, but not something that came naturally for that Pharisee on that particular occasion. What's, inter what's interesting to me when we reflect on Matthew chapter 5 and we think about the concept there, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is to, uh, and this is one of those occasions where we look over and see, well, what does Luke say? And, and Luke tells it just slightly different. You know, and again, that could be enough for you to say, well, these are two separate kind of events. Because in Luke chapter 6, in, uh, in verse 20, when he says, when Luke records 
A very similar message, including Beatitudes, not as lengthy a list as what Matthew records. He says this, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Does Luke mean something different? Well, maybe. You know, you could, I think, understand that there could be a different meaning there, a different um, lesson to be learned. Did he, you know, did he just accidentally leave off the idea of being poor in spirit? And maybe the suggestion about those who are poor tie in together. Yeah, let's, let's explore that for just a second. I think there's a lesson to be learned, you know, as Luke would say that, for those who would be hearing that message from Jesus, if you were poor, if you would listen to those words of Jesus and you found yourself in a, in a condition in a, your life where you didn't have a lot, well, you felt the weight of that. You felt the burden there. You were probably oppressed by those who had a lot. Maybe you took comfort in the words that Jesus said there. Blessed are those who are poor. Maybe as, you, as Jesus said those words, you could relate. You, you probably maybe nodded your head and, and, and thinking, well, he, he's talking to me specifically. All right? Maybe these things tie together. Maybe in, in some cases it's easier for those who don't have a lot to, uh, to be, uh, be humble, to exercise humility. I want to take you to Revelation chapter 3. I want you to think about what, what's recorded here by the Apostle John and speaking, you know, again, using the words of Jesus as he spoke about the different churches. And in Revelation chapter 3, some of you are familiar as you think about the, uh, the things that Jesus describes. Specifically in Revelation 3, he talks about the church in Laodicea. And, and when, uh, when these words are written, I want you to think about what's said here. Verse 15, chapter 3 in Revelation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that, would that you were either cold or hot? So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. That's a pretty well-known little, little statement there. We, if you've, you've heard that before, it's kind of sticks in your mind. An idea of a, of a lukewarm a beverage that just is not pleasing to God. To be spit out. But listen to what's said after that. What describes this lukewarm condition is this. Verse 17. For you say, I'm rich. I've prospered. And I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You know, the struggle with these people was that they, they were in bad shape and they didn't even recognize it. Right? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever, uh, have your eyes ever been opened? To the fact that you had a need, sometimes we, we can become, um, maybe we can become blind to problems that exist. Maybe we have little things that, that go wrong at home. We have little things wrong that take place with us physically and not until they become substantial and huge and, and become so large that they kind of knock us over do we recognize it and then actually do something about it. That's almost what's taking place here. People who are part of the church, you know, and that's what's humbling. Because, you know, hey, you know, it, it'd be easy for me to, to, to think or for, to, for, to call attention to the fact that we could look outside of this building. We could look at the world around us and say that there are people out there that are, that are wicked, that are evil, that, um, that, that don't have God in their lives. You know what? Some of them, they're, they're aware of that. But we need to look inward. And, and we look at, at ourselves as, as Christians as, as trying to be loyal followers of God. And maybe we might think to ourselves, I am, I'm rich. I'm doing well. Things are good. I need nothing. But as Jesus says, not realizing that that's not really true at all. 
that if they were to make an honest evaluation of themselves, they're, they're wretched. You know, they, they are poor. They may think that they're rich. That's not the case. They're poor. They may think they see things really well, but no, no, they're blind. They, they don't have an accurate view of themselves or anyone else. Jesus has to call attention to that. And so maybe when you think about the way that Luke says, blessed are those who are poor, well, maybe there's something to be gained there. To think that, you know what, when we have a lot, when we, you know, that maybe we can, we can, that possibly can cause us to become blind to spiritual condition because we feel like we have everything that we need. There's an Old Testament proverb that I probably, you know, these are, I think, words of wisdom and maybe an attitude that we, if you don't already embrace, maybe you do when you reflect on something like this. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 8 and 9, I appreciate kind of what's said here, the mindset that it kind of uh, gives us to consider. These are words that are spoken here in Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. That's probably where we'd like to be. You know, maybe we'd like to be right there. God, I really don't want to be so poor and desperate that I might be inclined to try to take from someone else. Because being poor isn't something that would bring about any pleasure. That would create a rough state in life. That would create difficulties that I don't want to experience. And so maybe that could be our, our mindset. I don't want to be poor, but you know, if you would keep me from being rich, I, I don't need more than necessary. Give me not poverty, but riches either. I don't want to be so full and, and deny you, Lord. Maybe there's wisdom in, in, in looking sometimes at, and thinking, you know, uh, um, I, I want to be humble. And if, and if these things get in the way, and that's maybe what Luke is speaking to in Luke chapter 6 and verse 20. To think about those who are poor, to think about those who, whose mindset, and, and, and so about your possessions and, and what's in your bank account and what you own, the mindset maybe can simply be, hey, those things aren't mine at all. You know, we give back, and, and oftentimes we might reflect on the things that we give to God were never ours to start with. God gave them to us. Sometimes those words are spoken from this very place. We reflect on that as we give back to him on a weekly basis. And maybe we do so in other ways as we give, as we serve. It's to think, you know what? What I, what I have is not about me at all. God provided this for me to use to give to somebody else. It doesn't have to be money. It could be talents and skills. It could be resources that you have. God's given me these things so that I can use those to bring him glory, to benefit him. So when you think about Matthew chapter 5, you think about Luke chapter 6, and you think, well, the words are just a little different, you know, and maybe you could kind of put those two together. But maybe even if the meaning is held separate, it's just as powerful to consider. I came across something just recently that caused me to even wonder just a little bit more that even the description between what's said in Matthew chapter 5 specifically, and, and if you want to tie in Luke chapter 6 as well, that even what, um, what was talked about here, being poor in spirit, could also, if implied, could also talk about uh, those who would be, um, well, the, the way that this was, that I read it, was those who would be considered lonely. Those who would be considered, uh, maybe if you consider to be a, an outcast, and you know, uh, that's gone, you know, the, the last year has, has caused people to feel loneliness, probably like never before, right? Because you had those who maybe already were struggling in that regard, and they experienced it in deeper levels. And, and maybe you, you've experienced loneliness, you know, and it hasn't been something that you've regularly endured, but over the last year, you've had times where you just kind of got tired of, of being homebound. Not being able to do what you want to not be able to interact with people. I told someone again just this morning, and I, a lot of times over the last year, you know, in Zoom, you know taking advantage of technology and, and doing things, you know, via Zoom and, and, 
and uh, messenger video chat and, and I've tried to stay connected with people and you look people in the eyes and boy I'm thankful for it right and for those of you that have used that what a blessing that we live in a time where we haven't had to be separated from from family completely but it's not the same right it's just not the same and, and for those who continue to worship online and I know there's some of you that, that do so this morning who uh, you know, many have told me they, they enjoy as much the before and after worship because they look and they see who's there. So if afterwards, if you get up and want to wave at the camera, feel free to. There's people watching you, right? They're taking note of you. But guess what? Those people that I've talked to, have communicated to you, they, they want to be here. They long to be here. And it might be next week or the week after, and they will be. But they miss it. And you know that because you've been there. Is not the same. Those connections with people. And so I found it fascinating that someone would call attention to this idea about being poor in spirit and, and, and refer to that being uh, something that, again, might refer to this loneliness. And for Jesus, when I think about Matthew chapter 5 and all these things that Jesus is going to say, that as we look through the Sermon on the Mount, is that Jesus' messages were always timely. And they're so perfect in that way. Because, you know, he said these words all those years ago. And here we are, Lawrence County, Indiana, 2021. And boy, they're powerful, right? Make us think. They challenge us to consider how we live. Just as if they just rolled off his tongue, they're, they hold just as much weight. And the same holds true when he spoke them. As people who were there nearby, his disciples who it, it referenced, or those from a distance who might have been curious as Jesus said these words, blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed who are those who are poor. He was speaking to people again who I can't help but think, nod of their head, or if they didn't show any kind of emotion at all, thought to themselves, he's speaking to me. And I think there were people there who were poor, and there were people there who were lonely. There were people who were there who, who thought this message is, is, is meant as, as comfort for me and, and what I'm going through. What a powerful message that Jesus gave. And again, the way that it impacts people then, the way that it impacts people now. I want to conclude with a, a familiar uh, verse in James chapter 4. You know, we look at James chapter 4, we think about James being a, a book that is, is uh, filled with all kinds of practical things for us to, to gain from. There's a simple reminder that we find in James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace, speaking about God. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I want us to think about this idea about being poor in spirit, or whether you consider it you know, more in a literal sense, those who are poor. And, and again, the humility that I think is, is, is called upon for us to embrace, to be humble. That's where grace is found. And sometimes we sing about it, we reflect on it, and I appreciate John's prayer earlier. We thank God for his grace. And it's that grace that's given freely to those who humble, him, humble themselves before God. Would you humble yourself today? You know, I know a lot of humble Christians. I know many that are here and, and, and a large number. You know, I, I, I admire when I witness humility in the lives of my Christian brothers and sisters. I've maybe even seen more of that over the last year. You know, because, again, an understanding and a realization that, boy, we, you know, difficult times. We just can't get through this on our own. We, we need God. This morning, the invitation is extended, and, and maybe there's some who need to humble themselves because it takes humility to say, I can't, I can't live this Christian life on my own. And I'm, I've been going solo for, for a while and, and too long. In fact, I need help. I need encouragement. I need the prayers of my family here to get me through. Maybe there's someone who's not yet a Christian this morning. And what, an act of humility begins with saying, I know that I'm lost, that I need Jesus, that I want what he has to offer me. 
You're willing to crucify the old self, being baptized into Christ, having your sins washed away, and to begin a new life today. Pray that we can always be humble, that we can be poor in spirit. And if you choose today to, to humble yourself in the sense of, of responding to the invitation to ask for help, we'd love to do so. And I know again that God would be willing to supply his grace and his love is with you. And again, as a church family, we want to be a support to you. If you have a need this morning, would you come now while we stand and while we sing together?
I got a quick announcement to make. Um, Spring Mill Bible Camp. We're coming back here. 2020, we couldn't have camp. This year in 2021, most of you might already be aware that, Lord willing, we plan to have camp sessions this summer. Uh, they're going to look a little different in a lot of ways. Uh, kind of the schedule that we've got for the summer with all the weeks ending on Friday. Some, including the one that I direct in June, used to extend till Saturday. But we're trying to allow extra time for cleaning between the weeks. Um, we're trying to create a, a bubble when we get there and not allowing people to come and go uh, just to kind of keep people safe. That's going to be uh, you know, on our minds as it has been for, for all of us. Uh, so anyways, some things to keep in mind. First off, if, if you want to help with camp, there's a lot to do to get ready in a physical sense. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll point you to Ashley Holt. I'll help you too. But if, you, if you're ever in a physical way and say, hey, I'd like to get involved with helping to get the camp ready. I was talking to Ashley yesterday. He said there are sticks to pick up at camp. Um, now, if you know, we've had all those rain the last couple days. Anybody have any sticks in their yard? All right. You know, that's just you know, what happens. There's always just kind of general pickup. And you can imagine the camp with how much ground we have, uh, that there is opportunities to help in the simplest of ways. There are very few people that look around you who are unable to pick up a stick. Right, so that's a simple task. I can do that. Now, if you're more skilled, there's more skilled jobs too. Ashley's got more information on some of those. Uh, but the main reason for my announcement this morning is that this year, one of the things we're doing different is we're doing registration online, and we're having limited capacity for all the weeks. None of the weeks are going to have as many kids as usual, uh, which which hurts me because uh, normally the week that I direct in June that Ashley's helped with in the past, and many of you have helped well, her work with, uh, we are full usually. Now we're going to cut back our numbers. I anticipate we're going to be full again, even though I know some, some kids, some parents may not participate this summer. So it's first come, first serve. Online registration is going to start next Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm getting the word out so that you can be ready at 3 o'clock, sit in front of your computer or on your phone or whatever you want to do. Because if you wait any longer than that, I won't promise you anything. Uh, I just don't know what to expect. We're going to wait and see. So it's just very important that I give you that heads up. If your kids are interested in camp, Maybe a different week. It doesn't matter. Next Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, uh, be ready to engage in registration online. Get signed up. All right. If you got any questions about camp, myself, Ashley, Jim Pierce, when Jim's here, uh, has information. There's others as well. Uh, but we look forward to kind of getting camp started back in 2021. Good morning. Good to see each of you out this morning, especially our visitors. Always have to have visitors with us and invite you back at any opportunity you have to worship with us. Update on some of our sick and a few other things here. Tommy Bartlett, the husband of Romona, Pierce Bartlett, will have a, a Arthur valve replacement on April the 20th in Lafayette. Dub Canada fell while out of town and had considerable pain around the hip that had been replaced. The orthopedic group that did the surgery determined that he had a twisted muscle. He's doing physical therapy and starting to feel better. Terry Sanders' test results indicate invasive bladder cancer. It is also in the muscle of the bladder. The stent that was inserted a week ago Tuesday was removed this past Thursday, and he will undergo th chemotherapy and then have surgery to remove the bladder. Everything points to it being contained to that one area. He will have more CT scans, but seems to be doing a little better right at the moment. Need to remember all of our shut-ins who have friends and family listed on our prayer list in the bulletin. Need to remember all those. Also, Schultz family, child and family services will be monetary donations only this year. Money can be collected during the month of April. You can give your checks or cash to J.R. Crane or, or mail or drop off at the office. And mark them for Schultz Willis Children's Home. On a sad note, Charlotte Jordan passed away Thursday morning. Visitation will be Tuesday evening, 6 to 8 p.m., with a celebration of life at 7.30 p.m. at Crest Haven. Gary has a bracelet back in the back that was found a week ago. So if somebody lost a small bracelet, Gary has it back there. He's holding it now. I can't even see it from here, but it's that small. <laughs> but see, Gary, if you lost a bracelet. If there's nothing else this time, please stand. We'll be just Bill. Wednesday morning Bible class will be meeting in the north foyer due to the sidewalk being replaced over there at the educational building. Please stand. We'll be dismissed with prayer.
Heavenly Father, we come to you, the one and only true and living God, realizing that you are the creator of all, that everything we have is a blessing from you. And we come at this time thanking you, Father, for loving us so much that you bless us each and every day the way you do. And we're so thankful, Father, that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus to serve to live and die, so that through him we have an opportunity to spend an eternal life with you. And Father, we're thankful we had this opportunity this morning together here this morning to worship you, to sing these songs of praises to you, hear a message from your word, and surround the table in remembrance of your son. We pray that everything we have said and done has been pleasing to you. And Father, we do pray for our many sick. We have so many that need your comforting hand to touch them. We pray especially that you be with Tommy Bartlett and the surgery he's facing, be with Terry Sanders and the serious surgery that he's facing also, be with Doug Canada as he continues to recuperate, and be with the many we have suffering from the terrible disease of cancer. We have so many at this time, Father, that need your comforting hand to touch them. And Father, we pray for all those suffering this virus that's going around the world. We pray that you will be with them and restore them to the normal proportion of health. And we're thankful for the vaccines that's been created to help prevent this virus from spreading further. And we pray that you'll be with the doctors, nurses, and the caregivers treating all those, Father, that keep them safe, that they can continue to do their job. And we're thankful for the men and women in uniform serving our nation, Father, to keep us safe. We pray that you'll watch over each of them, watch over the policemen in whatever capacity they may be, Watch over all those, Father, that are working behind the scenes to keep each of us safe. We pray that you'll watch over them and keep them safe. And we pray for the leaders of our nation, Father. We're so thankful for the land in which we live. And we pray that something be said or done, that each one in leadership position would look to you daily for wisdom and guidance so that our freedoms will continue. And, Father, we pray that you'll forgive each of us of our sins and mistakes that we do make. We know we're sinners. We know we fall short. We thank you that you, we can come to you through the power of prayer and ask for your forgiveness. In your son's blessing, we pray. Amen.